Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm going to turn my camera off while I'm presenting, um, but I can pop back in during the Q&A. So let me do that real quick. Um, all right. Okay, so hopefully everyone is seeing the slides here. Yeah, we're seeing uh, them. Perfect, thank you. So welcome, uh, my name is Melody Rood. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the student success and open education librarian um, here at uh, uh, UNCG Libraries. Um, and I'm gonna be talking to you about First Day Complete um, and some updates about it and what you should know. So before I get started, I'd like to give credit to Nicole Allen, who is the Director of Open Education at Spark, uh, which is an open education advocacy group. Uh, she's been very helpful and diligent about updating the latest information about this topic through listservs, emails, presentations. Um, and a portion of my presentation um, is from a presentation that she actually did, which uses um, uh, an openly licensed um, uh, Creative Commons uh, license. So uh, so you, you will see aspects of her presentation in my presentation, but uh, like I said, that was openly licensed. So I wanted to do a quick poll and just gauge um, how many people here understand how First Day Complete works. So um, you should see a poll pop up and it's going to ask you, do you understand how First Day Complete works? Yes, no, maybe, somewhat. Okay. Okay, I think we have 14 responses. Do you want me to share? Yes, please. Are y'all seeing it? <laughs> yeah, I can see it on my screen. Okay, great. <laughs> We're learning about polls. Do you see it, Melody? Oh, I think she accidentally left seeing the poll. Uh, she'll be back. <laughs> Did you accidentally leave? <laughs> no, it just kicked me out. <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. Okay. Teams. So um, I, I think I saw the poll right before I got kicked out and it looked like most people are like, a, yes, somewhat um, in that yeah, area. Yeah, so it's 50% somewhat, 7% uh, maybe, 7% no, and 36% yes. Okay, great. Um, so that gives me a good idea. Let me go back into present mode. Sorry about that, y'all. All right. And so we were here. And let me turn my camera off again. OK, so great. So let's talk about First Day Complete and how it works. So the way that First Day Complete works is that it uses a model called inclusive access. So what is an inclusive access model? And is the name potentially misleading? So let's talk about it. So inclusive access can sometimes be referred to as equitable access. Um, you might also see it referred to as just automatic textbook billing. Um, and this is the definition from inclusiveaccess.org. It says that inclusive access, also known as automatic textbook billing, is a sales model for college textbooks. So digital content is delivered to students by the first day of class, often through a learning management system. So um, Canvas, Blackboard, whatever it may be. Um, and then students have a period to opt out before they are billed through their tuition and fees. Um, so that is typically how it works. Um, so you can see how, like, you know, First Day Complete got its name. The idea is that it's delivering the materials by the first day of class. And instead of students having to pay um, in the moment, it gets charged to their um, overall tuition and fees. So there are... Um, two types of inclusive there there might be other types of inclusive access models that sort of um is a merge between these two, uh, two types but these are the two uh, main ones and we have uh, course by course which students um, in participating courses are charged the cost of their assigned materials through tuition and fees unless they choose to opt out 
Um, so students are billed the actual cost of materials. Um, the opt-out is usually course by course. Um, it's often volunteer. Uh, it's often voluntary for faculty if they want to participate in it. And open educational resources, which are openly licensed uh, free educational resources, will always still be free for students under this model. Um, so this could be good if you know you have a if you're um, um, a teaching faculty member and you have a really expensive chemistry book, uh, you could potentially participate in this and tell your students, hey, you might not have $300 for this book. Now, if you choose to, you can um, have it billed to your tuition and fees um, in which you would pay at a later date. Um, but they would have to know to opt out of that if you have chosen to be in that. Um, and then for classes where they wouldn't save money, they could they could choose to opt out. Um, and then there's the flat fee equitable access model. So um, uh, this is often referred to as equitable access. And this is where all students are charged a flat rate based on how many units or credit hours they are taking, no matter what their specific materials cost. So again, students pay a flat fee regardless of their own costs. Opt out is typically all or nothing by semester, so you can't um, decide to stay in for this class and opt out for this class. You have to um, opt out for the entire semester or stay opt in. in. Um, it is often outsourced to a single vendor. Um, all faculty must participate. It's it's not an option to not participate, um, and students will get charged even if faculty do assign. Uh, free educational resources um, through open licensing. Open licensing. Um, so that is the equitable access model. So what are some potential issues um, with inclusive access? So most of this is going to refer to mostly the equitable access model, but um, some of these will refer to um, both models. Um, but the first big thing is that access to materials expire after the course is over. It's important to remember that this is a rental and um, students are not um, able to keep the materials. Um, so not all courses use textbooks. So some courses might assign a series of readings through, um, you know, uh, journals through the library. Um, you know, do those courses still get charged if they are um, under inclusive access, if they are through the equitable access model, then yes, they are still charged. Um, tuition builds interest, so we're not really sure what the actual cost per credit is if they are being charged to their tuition. Uh, some courses have materials that cost less than the flat rate, so that's important to note. Um, the opt-out process is also confusing, um, and I've heard that from a lot of students myself. I've looked at the opt-out process, and I do think it's confusing. Um, it also removes competition to make the most sales. So, you know, if one vendor is getting all of the sales for all of the uh, materials on campus and students are automatically enrolled into that, then, um, you know, there's less competition with uh, Amazon, Chegg, or even like the local bookstore. Um, contracts, uh, we have seen uh, examples where contracts sometimes increase the rate without renegotiating. So the rate might be $20 now, but with inflation and everything, maybe uh, one year it's $30. And so that can increase without actually having to renegotiate a contract. It also removes incentive for faculty to consider less expensive materials or options, which is important because, you know, we've been trying to combat the rising cost of textbook textbooks for a long time, and so many faculty have done really great uh, things to uh, look for other options, whether it's um, OER or through library license materials or, you know, creating their own resources. Um, if, you know, faculty can now uh, assign a $300 textbook and students are only charged a flat rate for it, then sort of that incentive to push back against publishing companies, like making their prices really expensive, kind of is removed. Um, and then students have to make higher stakes opt-out decisions with less time. So they're usually given um, usually roughly two weeks um, once the semester starts to decide whether or not they want to stay opted in. 
Um, also, there's issues with third parties collecting data on students and general privacy concerns. I worked with an undergraduate student at UCLA um, where they had an inclusive access program through Pearson and a bunch of data um, got compromised and uh, thousands of students had their um, information um, put out there. Um, so that was like a huge issue. Um, the other thing is that not everyone wants electronic resources. Um, so these usually happen through e-resources that are sent to the um, learning management system. Um, but a lot of people like to use physical books, materials, um, and sometimes that's for accessibility reasons. Um, Another thing is if you do prefer a print copy, that can sometimes be an additional cost to the flat rate that you are already being charged. And there's often a limited number of print copies available that students can even get. It also doesn't factor in that students sometimes buy consumables that are not available through the bookstore. So things like art supplies, kits, and so on, which are not included in that, but they still get charged for the uh, credits that they're taking. Um, some courses may deny an access code if opted out. We've seen this happen before, which, um, you know, implies that there's not really a choice uh, to stay opted in or opted out if you are going to fill your class because you cannot access a code for it. Um, it also interrupts decades of progress for open education advocacy. And like I was saying before, sort of that pushback against publishers um, increasingly, um, you know, putting out really, really expensive textbooks. Um, also, the claims of savings are often greatly exaggerated, and they're sort of based on apples to oranges comparisons. So it's hard to compare the savings of a rental to a permanent thing that you buy. Also, the savings are usually um, measured by uh, the full costs of a textbook through the vendor in which, it, in which the inclusive access program is being provided. Um, and we know that students often shop around and they often don't pay full price for books. They um, will usually try to find a deal if they can find one. So. Um, it's hard to make that comparison. And this is fairly new. Um, there haven't been a whole lot of studies, but um, one study I did find showed that there was no statistical significance in academic success rate with an inclusive access model. So let's jump into First Day Complete at UNCG. So First Day Complete is a flat rate model or an equitable access model. The current rate is $20 per credit or $60 for your typical uh, three credit course. So what we know is that all undergraduate students are automatically enrolled. And um, from what I hear, graduate students are to be added soon. I've also heard some people say that graduate students have already been added, but maybe not have been charged. It's been very confusing. Um, students are charged the $20 uh, uh, rate or $60 for the three credit course. Um, courses with no textbook or that would otherwise be free of additional re, uh, resource costs are still going to be charged. Um, students can only opt out by semester, not course by course. Um, access to resources will expire at the end of the semester because, again, this is a rental program. So let me show you what that looks like if you were to search what your course materials are through the books, uh, bookstore's website. So this is just an example that I pulled. Um, I selected Fall 2023, English 105, and you can see here that it has the material and then it shows this message that says uh, these course materials are included as part of your UNCG First Day Complete program. So it's not even um, disclosing how much the materials cost. The only way that you can see how much the materials cost if you even want to determine um, if you want to determine whether or not to stay in the program is you would have to know to use the drop down menu when you're searching and to select fall 2023 opt out in which case um, once you do that and then you enter in the course um, and the course number the section uh, you can see the price and here we have an example where um, this book uh, new, uh, the print version is about $18 and a used version of it um, in print is about $13.50. And I assume these are books that you can keep. 
So in this situation, a student would be losing money uh, if they stayed opted in because they would be charged $60 for this class, even though the book can be bought for $18. Um, and unfortunately, like I mentioned, they can't choose to opt out by course. Um, they have to know to add up all of their classes to see if it uh, would be worth it to them. So let me show you an example of that. So let's say this is a, um, you know, a freshman or sophomore uh, um, class schedule for a semester. So um, we've got, uh, you know, maybe they're a business student. So they've got a couple of business classes as well as um, their general education classes in here. So we have FYE 101. Um, which, according to the bookstore's website, does not have any additional um, textbook costs, so that's zero dollars. Um, business uh, 216, um, uh, th that cost is forty dollars through the bookstore um, if they were to purchase it, not through the um, first day complete, or twenty one dollars on Amazon. Um, Accounting 201, we have uh, this pretty expensive book, which is $158 uh, through the bookstore, but I found it for $94 on Amazon. Uh, we have Business 130, which is a primer on sustainability, uh, $22 through the bookstore or $20 on Amazon, and CSC 105, $0, so no textbook. Um, so the total, if students were to shop around either new or through um, Amazon or other uh, sites, um, could be roughly $220 or $135. And again, these are for materials that they would be able to keep and potentially sell later or hold on to. So the way that First Day Complete works, um, it doesn't matter what uh, what the actual costs are, all classes will be charged at $60 if they are the typical three credit course. So FYE 101 is going to be $60. It's going to be $60 for Business 216 and so on. So you can see $60 for all of that, totaling $300 for digital resources that will expire. So this is just one example. In some cases, um, it might save students money. Um, so I'm, just, I'm putting it out there that it it definitely has saved students money before, but we also see where students lose money in some cases. So how does a program like this exist? Well, um, it exists under a very specific section of the cash man management section as part of like federal regulations, um, which states that any institution may credit a student's ledger account on things such as tuition and room and board. So that's why students don't aren't expected to have to pay for those things right away. They can have it credited to their ledger um, and pay it at a later date once they graduate. Um, and this previously did include um, books and resources with uh, only if there was uh, prior uh, permission from students. However, in 2016, a new section was added that allowed for books and resources to be credited uh, without authorization of students, so long as there was an opt-out policy. Um, and we've already seen how that could be an issue if students aren't aware of um, the opt-out deadline or how to opt out and so on. So currently, the summary of um, what the current regulations are as of today, um, an institution can bill uh, the books and resources through tuition and fees uh, without authorization if they um, have a third-party agreement to offer materials at below market rate. Um, provide access within seven days and have an opt out policy uh, or um, other uh, ways that they can do it is through um, a document that materials are unavailable from any other sources um, or they have a compelling health or safety reason, which was um, used frequently during the pandemic. So there has actually been a lot of push to change this regulation and there was a proposal put forward um, to the U.S. Department of Education um, which is currently undergoing negotiations for this that would change the model of automatic billing. So um, the proposal states that uh, they can 
um, you know, charge it to tuition and fees if they have a compelling health or safety reason. So that one stays, but they have to disclose prices before students give auth authorization each term and students choose to per uh, purchase materials from the institution and they have to offer materials at or below competitive market rates. So essentially it changes it from an opt out model where students are automatically enrolled and they, um, the the um, proposed change would make it an opt-in model. So I think this is really important because under the opt-out model, some people do save money, but if uh, there's confusion or if students miss the deadline, um, then uh, a single vendor will profit off of that confusion. Whereas in the opt-in model, uh, students don't really like lose out on anything. Um, they can choose to purchase their books the way that they normally have through shopping around, asking, um, you know, uh, friends if they have copies of like books that they used in prior semesters and so on. Um, but if it works for them, they can choose to opt in and then they would save money. So it's sort of guaranteeing that they save the money and that nobody is accidentally getting charged when they didn't mean to. So what will happen if this proposal is pr approved? Um, it would change the default model of inclusive access from opt out to some form of opt in and existing programs will have to adjust because it'll be a federal regulation. Um, it will uh, require greater upfront transparency about inclusive access costs before students decide whether they want to opt in. So things like not disclosing the price um, won't be allowed uh, and it will prevent students from getting billed by default. Uh, which may change how students um, opt in. All right, what this will not do if the propo proposal is approved, it's not going to end inclusive access models will still exist. It'll just be an opt in model. It won't affect students ability to voluntarily use financial aid for books and supplies, and it won't stop publishers from engaging in other practices that force students to buy textbooks. So things like access codes, online homework, and so on. So currently, I'll say that um, I've been keeping up with the proposed change and uh, there's been a lot of back and forth between different like groups who have been advocating for this change, mostly students and um, faculty, professors, instructors, and uh, open education advocates. And it sort of versus um, higher university administration and uh, vendors, publishers, uh, bookstores, and so on. Um, so uh, the decision hasn't been finalized, but the uh, U.S. Department of Education strongly signaled that they intend to move forward with the change proposal, which would force all um, inclusive access programs like First Day Complete to be an opt-in model. Um, and this has further sort of been solidified by the White House recently issuing a fact sheet where they specifically mentioned the in their intention to um, curb automatic textbook billing and what um, Joe Biden referred to as uh, uh, junk fees. Um, so this is something that um, we, uh, me as an open education advocate, believes to be sort of a win. But again, it's not set in stone just yet, um, but it looks like that is what is going to happen. And um, uh, just FYI, uh, if it does fully get approved, um, the uh, um, there won't be any sort of like formal rulemaking notice um, until uh, later on, and then those rules won't be applied until um, at the earliest July 1st of next year. So um, as the model exists now, we have that for another year, um, and it could even be later than July 1st. So some things that you can do is you can educate yourself um, on what automatic textbook billing models look like. Um, there's a website, inclusiveaccess.org, that I think is pretty useful. Um, SPARC is that um, open education advocacy group that I mentioned, um, and they have a policy page that has um, really active um, um, updates on uh, what's going on in terms of policy and open education, and this includes a lot of inclusive access stuff. Um, 
when it's time to, when the uh, proposed rule is uh, officially published in the Federal Register, it, uh, there will be a lot of, um, uh, essentially, people will be able to submit public comments, and they anticipate that will happen this summer. Uh, once I find out, I will definitely be emailing all of my colleagues about it so that they can, um, if if they choose to, um, you know, have a public comment there. Um, and then for the time being, uh, determine if your course materials are cheaper or more expensive than that flat rate, so $60, and then talk to your students about the process of deciding to stay opted in or not. Um, remembering that even if your course uses something um, more expensive than $60 or less expensive than $60, they still have to look at all of their classes and add that up. So that is the basis of the updates that I have for you, and I can take uh, any questions now. Okay, the nice thing about Teams is that I can see the order. So, uh, Shelby, you're up first. Hey, Melody, thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, I want to know, uh, other than Barnes & Nobles, is there another uh, major company or publisher that is running our first day complete? No, um, Barnes & Noble Education is the only vendor that is running our first day complete program. Um, but there are lots of like, you know, the big names like Pearson has one um, and other major textbook um, publishers uh, have their own version of it. Interesting, thank you. Yep. April, you're up next. Sorry, finding the microphone. Uh, so, I guess the question I have is, will will every textbook be available through First Day Complete? So, uh, you know, I'll, an example is um, in our school library courses, we require the standards for school libraries and learners. And I know what it costs from ALA, but we get a discount. They get it for half price uh, through our class but that's a different process. So I'm guessing it's still gonna be the normal non-member ALA rate if, I, if they get through Barnes & Noble. Yeah, that's that's a little confusing. I'm not really sure the like sort of um, agreements they have on the back end with different publishers. Um, and I'm not sure if all books are available. This is something that's always been a little confusing to me is that, you know, what if you're a professor and you submit like, your course materials to first day complete, expecting that they will have a digitized version available to your students on the first day of class um, at that $60 price. Um, but what if they can't get it? Like what if like they just cannot get it through the publisher? Um, that has always been a little confusing for me. Um, I know that when first day complete first rolled out, there was like a lot of issues with um, people not having the materials or the things not being available on the first day, which was what they like sort of promised or like they there was like a lot of back orders, which prevented people um, not able to opt out in time. Um, at one point, they even closed the opt out window before the like advertised date. And then they had to like um, we only found this out because um, somebody asked about it at our reference desk and we had to like email a uh, higher administration to be like, hey, there's people who want to opt out, but like the window is already closed. So there's been all kinds of issues. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer to that question, but I'm not really sure how they negotiate with publishers on getting that digital resource. Well, I, I know that, sorry to continue on, but uh, yeah, I teach entirely graduate students. And then that discussion rumor about the graduate students being uh, included in it um, has them all asking me questions. So uh, yeah, it, it sounds like y'all don't really know any more than I do. All yeah, that one. that's one of the main issues is that there's just like a lot of um, confusion around it all. And I imagine, you know, 
they are aware of the potential rulemaking that will happen. And a part of me wonders if they will definitely push for graduate students to be included um, in the fall semester uh, so they can profit as much as they can before they're forced to change. Okay, thanks. Elise. Hey, Melanie, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really informative and helpful. Um, I, this is a good order because I am also piggybacking off what April mentioned is that I'm a graduate coordinator and the rumor mill is definitely going. I don't actually think it's a rumor. I think our, our dean of the graduate school announced that this was happening for graduate students. Um, and so it's all new to me. Um, and I'm what I think I'm most worried about is um, how to communicate to students what they need to do or not do. Um, and so um, this isn't really a question, maybe just a polite request in that I'm hoping that maybe someone at the university is gonna come up with some like step-by-step -step directions that we can share with students to guide them on how to opt out of this program. Um, for me in particular, I run an online program. I've worked really closely with librarians to get ebooks for all of my mm -hmm. students and open access. I mean, I've spent five years doing this for my program. And so for my students to be forced into some system where they're forced to buy books, it does not make any economic sense for my students. Um, and so I know I'm, I might be a little bit out here on my own with that, but I mean, I definitely am going to tell my students to opt out of this. And so I want to know um, how to do this um, it, you know, and how to guide my students in, in making sure that they are making the best economic choices. Yeah, that's that's great. And if if you at any point ever want me to come and talk to your students, I can. But one one thing that I think is helpful, especially for graduate students who I, I feel like a lot of graduate students like to keep their materials because they like to build their library yeah. and like the field that they are interested in mm -hmm. um, is one making sure that they are aware that if you know, if it goes through that they are automatically enrolled, they that they are being charged $60 per class, regardless of how much the materials cost or if there's even materials. Like you said, you made a huge effort to um, make your uh, courses uh, free, affordable through open access, library e-resources. Um, that's something that we've been a huge proponent of. And this um, inclusive access model has essentially uh, um, killed our programming <laughs> around that. Um, so essentially what they would need to do is they would need to look up all of the textbook that they have for their classes, what the required materials are, um, see how much it costs by shopping around on th different websites, bookstores, whatever it may be, and then compare that to a $60 per class and see if it works in their favor. Um, if for some reason, you know, like they do save money in it, then, you know, they might want to choose to stay opted in for that semester, but they would have to do it for all classes um, and then decide. And then I believe the opt in, opt out um, motion happens through um, the learning management system. Um, I think they have to go in and opt out that way. I've actually never seen it done. Um, I have a couple of colleagues who are um, taking some graduate courses and um, they've seen how it's done but I believe it's through the um, management system. And I can look into that a little further um, and maybe even see if I can get some screenshots too. So I have a follow-up question, if you sure. don't mind. <laughs> um, and this actually might be for Sam. Um, I did invite my students to this, um, but most of my students are working professionals, so they're at work right now. Um, Sam, I know this is, is recorded. Um, can I share it with my students? It, will I have access to be able yeah. to do that? Yeah, the way stream okay. works is that sometimes access is a little funky. I try to set it up that anyone with a link can view, but Microsoft has been, uh, I would say, finicky when I do that. Uh, yeah. And uh, But it, it goes on YouTube too. So oh, cool. um, okay. yeah, when I send out the email, I'll send you all the stream link, which includes the transcript and then the YouTube link. The YouTube link just takes a couple of days for the closed captioning to kick in. Uh, so that's why I send both the stream and the YouTube. Yep, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so Andrea asked, would you know if there is a convenient website where we can go see all the FDC deadlines? <laughs> um, yeah, I think the um, I think first day complete 
through Barnes and Noble has like their own website where they have the deadline in there. Um, it's usually always roughly like two weeks once the semester has started before they can um, opt out. I always try to look for it and then share it with my colleagues. Um, but uh, I they they should list it on their website, um, the like official first date complete um, through Barnes and Noble at UNCG's website. Uh, let's see, how do students know about this process and the opt out window? Is there something that can we give out during SOAR that explains this process with those examples? Um, yeah, so I do have, I did create, I, I wish I had it with me, a bookmark that, um, you know, sort of walk students through the process that's like, um, is first day complete right for you? And it sort of tells them that they need to um, look at the cost of all of their materials combined at different places and then compare that to the flat rate. Um, also, it, you know, it, it mentions that these are uh, uh, rentals that will expire. Um, I, I haven't been able to sort of like measure the impact of that, uh, but we did give them out. Um, I will say, and I know this is being recorded, but uh, I, I feel like the library has had to be a little um, stealthy about how we talk about this because we have experienced pushback from the people who, um, you know, signed the contracts. Uh, so uh, we've been trying to be as, you know, objective as possible, but with the realization that most of us in the library are pretty like biased about it. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Um, somebody has put in the, uh, first day complete bookmark. Thank you so much. Um, and honestly, I think that like even this bookmark um, could be, uh, could use some better like examples or something. But um, yeah, and I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm always trying to work toward making students understand what the opt out instructions are. Um, but I think that they're, yeah, like Sam said, they're not great. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, we're trying, and hopefully if this uh, rulemaking proposal does go through, then that would mean that uh, uh, they would be forced to change into an opt-in only model. So students who don't know anything about first day complete, they like never even heard of it, which we know is the case for some people, um, are not gonna get charged for it. They'll they'll still have to find their materials and that's been an issue is that like a lot of students don't know about it and then I would I talk to students who are like waiting for their materials that they ordered through like Amazon and I'm like oh do you know that you should be provided your materials through first day complete and that you're being charged for it and they're like what is first day complete um, so that is a situation where the program would profit off of that student's confusion and we're trying to um, push back against that yeah, just like anecdotally too, a lot of instructors don't know about it. Like we get emails or I get emails from my departments, you know, being like, oh, you know, like I've sent them here, I've sent them there, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, have you turned first day complete on because they're already getting the books if they didn't opt out and they're like, what? You know, so I think the marketing overall, which I, I don't know, again, I know this is being recorded. So like thoughts and prayers, but I, I think we have a problem at UNCG about this kind of marketing to like hit everyone and get everyone to really read the email or read the information um, that is not, of course, any one person's fault by any means. It's just like this, the, you know. So anyway, I'm just saying, I think, you know, if y'all could spread the words too, even to your departments um, about this, just to get people aware um, as well. Um, so yeah, Lo Lois says, if students ask about shopping around resources, we recommend allbookstores.com. When patrons need to replace books, it will search tons of websites online and you can sort by rental, use new, different price points, et cetera. And just anecdotally, I'm sure Lois can talk about this more. Um, you know, we do see students use the course reserve um, if you're doing in-person classes. Um, so that's good. Um, so yeah, Internet Archive is a good one. Um, great. Okay, I do want to be a little bit sensitive of time. It's 11.43, so people have to go. That's totally understandable. Um, just to give a couple of follow-ups, um, I will be sending out a form with the email to the recording uh, about how this went. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, I like 
always get into the discussion and then forget to send it out ahead of time. Um, here it is, I'll pull it up. Um, and we do have one more um, research and application webinar this semester. It is um, next week, I think at the same time, let me look, um, Tuesday, yep, 11 a.m. next Tuesday on bullet journaling and research by Jenny Dale. Um, so here is the, oh, it logged me out somehow. So I'm not, Never mind. Forget the form out. You'll get that in the email. Um, but here is the, page for the next um, one, Bullet Journaling and Research, sounds great, by Jenny Dale, uh, next Tuesday, March 26th at 11 a.m. Uh, that link includes information about that webinar as well as the sign-up link. Uh, so remember, like we said before, the sign-up means you also, if, even if you can't come live, you do get an email for the recording. So everyone who signed up for this that couldn't come live will get an email to the recording. Y'all are welcome to share recordings with your department. They also live on that same web page. Um, as Joshua says in the chat, thank you for your work to communicate this information, Melody. This is, of course, really important. We, of course, feel very passionately about this in the library. Um, we really appreciate you, Melody. And um, any final questions as we're kind of wrapping this up? And thank you all for staying um, till 11.45 to have some conversations. It's great. Okay, I see some people chatting. I think it's mostly just probably hopefully praising you, Melody. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I will, again, be on the lookout for the email. Please fill out the form letting us know how this went so we can keep uh, doing this kind of programming for you. The form also has a space for suggestions for other materials. Um, I know there's a lot of librarians in this room. If you all have um, suggestions for topics, let me know as well. Um, and thanks, everyone. Have a great Tuesday. I had to think for a second. <laughs> Tuesday. Bye. Thanks, Okay, Sam, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, everyone's gone, so we can leave. Uh, thanks. I'll see you soon. Bye. Okay, see ya. Bye.